Welcome to Rhythm of Previews, where we check out the preview chapters of Rhythm of War, the fourth Stormlight Archive novel. I am Danielle with the 17th Shard. And I'm Robin. Hi. Hello. <laughs> oh, so just as a note to people who prefer audiobooks, um, just in case you weren't aware, Brandon Sanderson has been uploading the audio chapters onto his YouTube channel. If you've been waiting for the audiobook to start reading, you can join in the discussion with us leading up to release day. Check it out. As a note, maybe we should point out that they did upload all chapters already, so you can check out all of them because they initially said they'd do them each day, one chapter until they caught up, but I guess they decided to just dump them all. Oh. I didn't realize that either. (laughs) So as always, Rhythm of War spoilers ahead. There's a little bit of Warbreaker discussion in the annotations. Speaking of which, which annotations did we have for chapter 15? So Brandon and Pendy was really excited for us to finally get to to get to this chapter. Uh, Like the conversation with Relaine was really interesting to him and he wanted us to read it because it... um, and like what Ray, Relaine does with like the gemstones and the farming, because um, he wanted to us to finally f- find some sort of behind the scenes stuff of how the listeners managed to survive on the Shattered Plains. And he obviously also enjoyed writing a fight using Awakening again in this chapter. Like it's been, I guess, uh, Vivenna used some Awakening in, in, um, Oathbringer, but we didn't really see her use it for the fight. So uh, that's, yeah, I, I can imagine that Brandon really liked that, going back to that story a little with um, or the magic system. And, uh, but uh, what Brandon has said before about the cosmic crossovers, like where, where he's like, yeah, okay, he's feeling confident with, that we can finally or uh, slowly start leaking more stuff in a way or like start getting more crossovers he doesn't think that Vesha and or like Sahel doing these um, doing awakening here is really that much of a crossover because to the every or to the reader who hasn't read Warbreaker or the rest of the Cosmere it can basically be just this mysterious guy who can do awesome stuff and when compared it to Gandalf in Lord of the Rings because like we have the mystical magician in a way who um, can do these fantastical things and nobody really understand or like in world they don't really understand what he's doing but unfortunately this also was the last really cosmic aware chapter uh, in the previews at least and brandon did say that we will get some more but much later in the book so you have to wait for it to be released and actually read them then <laughs> It seems really surprising to me because you would think that like Shallan's whole arc would be mm-hmm. a little more Cosmere centric. So yeah. but, maybe uh, she just I, kind of brushes it off. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Or maybe like the journey in Shades uh, like, um, will take a whole of part two or something. And then mm-hmm. we won't get Shallan few points up until part four or something. I could imagine mm-hmm. he like he split it in some way as well. But yeah, regarding the fight uh, in general that uh, Vesha and Kaladin had uh, last time, we were wondering mm-hmm. ourselves whether, like he or Vesha, whether he had access to mental command or like some weird other ability. But apparently, um, he just or we can just assume that Vesha whispered the commands, and so Kaladin wouldn't be have been able to hear them. And yeah, so that's good to know that. He is like just you know, pressing. Uh, after all breath. of our speculation <laughs> last episode, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all of our theory crafting. No, he was just whispering. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like that's sort of uh, epitomizes uh, the seventeenth shower, like our community, because it can be a simple explanation. But why have a simple explanation when you can have all these yeah. <laughs> magical things? Yeah, and uh, finally. Brandon said that like Vesha was saying something like, oh, that guy up there in the prison, he also is uh, the same happened to him, like that he was dead and was um, reborn sort of as a cognitive shadow or yeah, returned. That is an informed guess is what Brandon said, but uh, uh, Vesha doesn't know 100% because I don't think it's really like um, Seth doesn't, ha- doesn't have really the other ability. Uh, 
attributes of a cognitive shadow. I think Wesher uh, just doesn't know quite enough for him to figure it out completely. Yeah. Yep. That was a lot of uh, annotations yeah. and clarification of the last chapter. I think we got a little excited when we read it. And so <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I think that was for a lot of people got very mm -hmm. excited. So good to have some clarification. <laughs> Definitely. And I feel like Bren said it in the annotation. You could really read it out of it. Like he really enjoyed writing that chapter too. So yeah. And good as we're coming to an end with the rhythm of previews, it makes me really feel a little sad because as we're reading Rhythm of War, we won't have these chapter by chapter mm -hmm. annotations and we're not going to have the chapter by chapter discussion and theorizing and stuff like, like we are now. So it's a little mm -hmm. bittersweet, but I know I'm going to yeah. like read the whole book that day that it comes <laughs> out. <laughs> yep. All righty. Well, let's get into chapter 16. So um, our epigraph basically says that the fused use a variety of Fabrials and Navani believes that they are accustomed to using Fabrial technology due to the speed at which they develop them. And this is how she's yep. concluding her papers, basically. Mm -hmm. That For one, that makes me wonder like, what we, we have... Uh, what is it? Three annotations left. So, eh, mm -hmm. not annotations, but epigraphs. So, mm -hmm. what will she be talking about? There is it just like, will will the lectures continue, or will it be something else? That's a little weirder feel when she says it's the final one. Um, yeah. So. Well, yeah. Maybe maybe she is just like, this is the first sentence in her last paragraph. <laughs> it could be. Yeah. Very well. But uh, speaking of the. Uh, Talking about the uh, epigraph itself, I find it a little weird, I guess, that uh, Navani just is, or like, how she does she come to the conclusion that the sing, uh, the fuse must have had these fabrics for such a long time? Like, is, does she just think the singers aren't intelligent enough or something to figure out fabrics uh, that quickly? That's yeah, I was definitely true. getting a bit of a vibe that she has some kind of bias against them that mm -hmm. they're not able to create them that means that they just already have them yeah. it's kind of a weird way of um assuming how they're coming up with these fabrials because mm -hmm. the fabrials are are she even mentions that they're countermeasures so it doesn't make sense to me why they would automatically have a countermeasure yeah in reaction to what they're being, you know, attacked with or whatever. Mm -hmm. So and it's kind of strange. I feel like with the uh, Wendy chapter that we had where the nine talked about, or uh, wanted to know whether the Fabriel that, um, what's his name? A uh, lesion. Oh yeah. Uh, whether mm -hmm. the Fabriel that uh, lesion used worked like that, um, search binding suppression Fabriel. And I feel like they wouldn't, uh, they would have known that, if it worked, if they already had the technology. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I feel like nobody's just strong there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, it's kind of a theme that that it's supposed to be, you know, you have your expectations and it's completely subverting it. So, um, eh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's good It's good to have character flaws and things. So <laughs> That is, yeah. But uh, what it did make me one of this epigraph, whether maybe the fuse, like they have human um support like the iriali and uh, others so i wonder whether they uh, all these creations are by human antifabrians that have just switched sides or something so mm. i feel like we have some stuff to explore there and discover yeah definitely i mean we saw that they have the seamstresses and the tailors mm. and everything so it kind of follows that they would have artifabrians and and ardents under yep. their employ. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Um, so this chapter is from Navani's point of view. The chapter title is An Unknown Song. Um, so it starts with Navani questioning Seth about the void light um, looking black sphere that um, she recovered. And uh, she asks him as she had several times to recount the day of Gavilar's assassination. And um, 
Over time, she's trying to pity Seth because she thinks of him as being sick of mind. Um, but she's very uncomfortable there and her discomfort forces her to leave this kind of gel cell, it, which actually is kind of like a room that they turned into mm-hmm. a fake jail cell. <laughs> <laughs> she finds herself up high in the tower and discusses some findings with the Ardents, and she shows that black sphere to a jeweler who's working on a telescope, and she asks the, the Ardent to run some tests and report, report back to her. Um, and then Shalon and Adolin, as well as Dalinar and Teravangian show up and Mink. So all these different characters from the whole first part, <laughs> uh, they show up up there. So Navani, Dalinar, Mink, Shalon, and Adolin go into a private room and they're going to show Mink some maps that Shalon light weaves in front of him. <laughs> and that's how it ends. Yep. So let's start <laughs> at the beginning where we finally um, get some insight of how white light looks because mm. um, it's always been like we have had people describe it as like this black violet light, but we never really had some more scientific explanations of what it would look like. And I find it really cool that um, Rushu the Ardent is telling Navani that it, this is like she calls it hyperviolet or something like that. So, and um, this is based on the concept of Stygian colors mm-hmm. in real life. And that's really cool that Brendan has sort of found a way to put this into the book in a sort of inward way. Yeah, I thought that was really cool too, because it's a real world phenomenon. Mm-hmm. So you can see these Stygian colors by looking at an opposite color and then looking at a black surface. So if you want to see what void light looks like, <laughs> you can look at a yellow surface for like a while i i tried it this morning for about 30 seconds and then you look at a black surface and the color that you see the after image is called stygian blue and it's kind of like this blue black color which is really cool Mm -hmm. yeah it really is and it's not something that you can actually replicate with like pigment or anything Mm -hmm. so it's it's a really neat fantasy element that's actually (laughs) real (laughs) yeah and i love how like navani doesn't really believe rushu like uh, how can there be a color that doesn't really exist and Mm -hmm. like that and just like rushu a lot as well but then they make a very distinct difference between the void light in that's captured in the gemstones versus this black sphere because they look the same they're the same color but the black sphere apparently like kind of ruffles the exterior or something like the light yeah, around they, it warps around mm-hmm. or something. So pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, at least the black sphere is on the right hand, or I guess it leaves Navani's hands in this chapter, but uh, it is now in the hands of um, the, of the Ardens and like the uh, scholars mm-hmm. of, of Rosha. So I hope mm-hmm. or I expect them to find it, figure something out there. And um, yeah, it's cool that yeah, Navani just finally gets to investigate it a little more. Yeah, I really like her chapters in this book so far. It's I feel like when I was reading it, I feel like Navani is almost an extension of us, <laughs> the reader, because she's asking all of the questions that we are asking. And so it's a really neat character to follow because she doesn't know things but she wants to learn and we are like desperate to learn all of these Mm -hmm. things so really really neat chapter with lots of information for the geeks (laughs) yeah and it's also good to have finally finally have an external viewpoint of how Seth behaves and like how Mm -hmm. he yeah how his um mental problems i guess manifest outside because like we know he hears these voices and uh um it's like plagued by them having somebody externally see that is really cool to finally get a, some perspective on it i feel yeah i know when navani was in there it was all brightly lit mm-hmm. um with with 
I think it was gemstones that were infused yep. with stormlight. Um, mm-hmm. And, but she felt so uncomfortable in there and it reminded me of how people act around night blood. And yeah. so I was thinking, she's thinking that it's, it's being in proximity to Seth, but it's actually, in my opinion, it's actually that she's around night blood and she's feeling really uncomfortable because she's not like, you know, his definition of evil. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that because, um, like Navani says, it's how, how about how Seth killed Gabela, of course, and how um, she still just uh, hates him and like, yeah, it's repugnant to him in a way, I guess, in that um, way, and that she feels ill because of that. But the way she describes it, like, it's, she actually feels um, bad to her stomach there, and that seems to. Um, yeah, agree with how people perceive night blood when they are deemed good. Yeah, as you said, it uh, are not evil by him mm-hmm. or by it. So yeah, and it also makes think. sense that Navani wants to throw night blood into the ocean, which I don't get honestly, but it helps. Like, it helps me understand why she would want to do that. <laughs> yeah. My draw honestly dropped when I read that they apparently just sank the thrill I never would uh, unmade into the ocean. Mm-hmm. Like, especially Navani, she, why, she would have been the first person to say, oh, maybe we can turn this into a fabric or something like that. So uh, why did they do that? It's, I know, it seems it seems weird because then they can't keep an eye on it. Mm-hmm. And like we know from several instances that things can be recovered from the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't get it. Like, I really don't. And not only the the fact that Nurgle, whatever, mm-hmm. is is there, but that's a perfect gemstone too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they're yes. losing this really powerful artifact too. I don't, Mm -hmm. it didn't make sense to me. Not at all. Kind of, but I I guess Navani and Dalinar came up with that idea together. Yes, they at least came up together to um, keep, or like they decided together they would keep uh, Seth alive, which Mm. I find is just a cool touch there, when especially like, explicitly said they decided together. Because we in the earlier chapters, we sort of saw how Navani really struggled with uh, being recognized and um, does wants Delena to treat her as an equal and not like just command stuff without asking her first. So it's cool that they decide together to keep him alive. I agree. Definitely shows growth on Dalinar's part where he's oh, yeah. make, help, making decisions, informed decisions with the agreement of the people that he's, you know, married to and the people <laughs> that he's working with for this country you know mm-hmm. uh, but i also found interesting how apparently delina insisted on keeping nightblood with seth here so mm-hmm. i wonder whether it's just like instinct or something or like he because seth, uh, seth actually seems like a good candidate for holding nightblood because he doesn't really want to kill anymore like he's mm-hmm. uh, haunted by all the people he killed so like it's relatively safe with him, while with others they might use Nightblood. Yeah, it's cool to see. Like, oh, I wonder whether Delena just I don't know saw that or whether he has some deeper knowledge. Because what we've seen so far, he seems to be a little myste- more mysterious in this book in a way. Because like, oh yeah, there's nine types of fuse and stuff like that. He just apparently just knows stuff now. Yeah, uh, and I really wanted to know what blood was saying during this whole thing like you know how chatty he is oh, yeah. um and poor poor seth who's kind of not all there anymore um mm-hmm. he seems to be forgetting or maybe not forgetting but intentionally not giving all of the information or yeah. something and so it makes me wonder what their conversation was during this conversation with navani <laughs> <laughs> it um what I also found funny that one there was one line how like uh, they had to convince Seth to finally convince Nightblood not to talk to people as they were bo- to- uh, walking by the cell. Mm-hmm. I can just imagine like, oh hello, would like to destroy some evil. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I I guess that's probably a good thing because mm. you never know. It is. You can yep. manipulate people to do. <laughs> yeah. I wonder how Nightblood feels being locked in. Well, locked in this cell. 
Um, hmm, I wonder whether Nightbird even really realizes that, like, because it does have a weird perception of at least time and presumably space as well. So Major thinks or uh, doesn't really care. But yet, if it notices that they are not really moving or not, he's not. Or it's not being put to use. Uh, he'll probably react weirdly in some way. Mm. But we do see how how Seth is mm. reacting to it. He's kind of in a good place almost <laughs> where he's in there. You know, they gave him everything that he asked for. They gave him all the light to, I guess, let the, the voices be uh, a little quieter for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, like, um, I wonder whether that uh, the fact that he wants to uh, wants the room to be completely lit without any shadows is all because in all three we sort of had that that in the shadows that it's where the voices come from but i wonder mm -hmm. whether it's maybe also something to do with high spren and like uh, his spren in particular who he doesn't want to talk to him or something like that so he because it also reminds me of the fact that he is in fact not truthless and um mm -hmm. yeah so maybe it's something to do with that as well it's possible. And then he mentions also when he was in Shinovar that the uh, the prophetic death rattles um, were happening there too, which is kind of interesting to, yeah. to hear. Yeah, so I guess it's confirmation that uh, Mölach, uh, whatever you probably, however you pronounce it, was in Shinovar at some point. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's interesting because um we've seen him like uh or like tarantian is also interested in where he's moving and he's been moving towards the uh, hondia peaks i think is what they last found out mm -hmm. so i yeah, wonder just how much traveling sort of he did across rosha in uh, since the desolations yeah, because it seemed like that's a that's a common thing over in mm -hmm. Shinovar, because they they kind of revere that as prophetic you know words so uh i wonder how long it was it's been going on there and if it's not going on there now yeah maybe it also was just like they have stories of prophecies or something like that so it was mm -hmm. way in the past or something but definitely wishing we finally had some self flashbacks to shinova mm -hmm. <laughs> do wait which book is he supposed to be he's supposed to be book five now i think Oh, because he was supposed to be Oathbringer, I think, and Book Five was supposed to be Delana, but mm -hmm. Brand decided to switch them around. I think is what happened. Yeah. Hmm. So. So he'll probably have like a, a kind of a big part in this if oh, he's yeah. going to be the main flashback for next book. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Brandon has said that from Seth in this book we will only get one interlude. So. We'll really have to wait for book five, unfortunately, to find anything out. But uh, then hopefully we'll si finally have some answers to what the Shin are like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and then we have Nivani, who is looking out over what was it called? The cloud walk, mm -hmm. I think? Yeah. which I think is such a cool, like I can just <laughs> yeah. picture it in my mind uh, up really high in the tower, looking over everything with the clouds below you. I think that's so cool. Mm -hmm. But she's looking down over all the people that are arriving or that are living there now. And she sees all of these different people. She sees all the Lethi. She sees the Azish, the Makabaki. And she even sees humans from Amia. <laughs> how how can Nevada or like Britain just drop it on us like that? Like how? <laughs> <laughs> like for Navani, it's just oh yeah, yeah. Those, those people are from Kenya. Exactly. For us, but, it's like wait, what? <laughs> yeah. How? 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 <laughs> how is it possible? Like we? I, I mean, it, I guess it makes sense that there are humans on Amia, but so far everything seems to have suggested that there are the either the um, Sia Amians or the Sleepless. But apparently, mm -hmm. there's just regular humans there as well, and that's going to be confusing. <laughs> yeah well yeah <laughs> for sure it's just erythru erythru mm -hmm. uh, it reminds me of like the tower of babel you know 
Mm-hmm. Except in reverse, because all these people from different cultures and lands are all coming together and living here and creating a society in this huge city tower place. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is, it's a really neat. And just seeing it from Navani's eyes, looking out over all the people, it really immerses me in this story of, you know, the, the tower, the sleeping tower. I just thought mm-hmm. that was really neat. Yeah. And I feel like uh, it at least gives us some idea of what it would have been like uh, in like a, when the Silver Kingdoms still were around and so like that. So mm-hmm. uh, it goes to show that like these humans can really come together, and uh, yeah, when they come together, they achieve much greater things. So on a more meta level, that's also really cool. Mm-hmm. And then and- they were doing all of the studies of how the tower is they're thinking the tower is reacting to the storms which is yep. really cool like the temperature they say is what it's raising yeah it's like, like the, they said five degrees or something mm-hmm, yeah i know i think that the five degrees where there was temperature difference between um the bottom of the tower and the top i think mm-hmm. But at least um, she said that, or the the, uh, Ardent who did that math said that the air pressure rises uh, in preparation for a storm and the temperature. So I feel like there's like two functions. One is the um, storm preparation and the other is sort of uh, the heating element, I guess, uh, where Mm -hmm. it's just warmer um, the further up you get, which is Mm -hmm. really interesting. Yeah. And... Something else that was interesting about that, Navani said something like um, she felt a little cold because she expected it to feel cold or something like that. So I feel mm-hmm. like that function probably has something to do with perception as well. Um, but then again, they do have a measurable difference. So there are some physical changes as well. Maybe she's just mentioning that in that she didn't realize it until they said something. Could be, yeah. yeah. Before Navani even talks to the to the uh, scientists, there's something very important that happens because she uh, sees Gavinor and hugs him and talks to him, and that's just ah, oh, he's adorable. But you can also notice that, like he, if he doesn't become a radiant in the back five uh, books, I don't know who will, because like mm-hmm. he has this trauma from how he was treated in Kaolina and like his father was killed and all that. So how yeah. old is he in this chapter? I think she says he's five. Like he, he's Cause I know five. it's been a year since he yeah. was punted across the courtyard. <laughs> yeah. By Moa. <laughs> by <Moa. laughs> yeah. I think he's, she says he's five and that he, uh, like all the, um, Ardens and, uh, like the, uh, surge or not surges, but the doctor says, say he's too small for his size. So yeah, I guess mm-hmm. his, his, um, I guess his psychological condition also stunted some of his growth or something like that. I feel like mm. that's likely, but cool to see him around at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's kind of sad because he's, he's kind of showing this obsession for revenge for, oh. you know, his father being killed and he's, he's, wanting to get a sword he's wanting to learn with dalinar and navani's telling him oh yeah maybe okay (laughs) but navani sees that the society and everything is changing it's not so warlike like like it originally was you know there's men who are reading now and Mm. women are joining the ranks so things are changing so it's almost like she doesn't want him to go that path of you know becoming a uh, i don't remember what they said when they're 10 years old, they become mm-hmm. some kind of member of the military or something. Yeah. They become like eights or something like that. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And- Which is sad. <laughs> 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 like kids. I, uh, kids. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, that makes me wonder whether Navani and Gavala, like how they treated Eloka when he was this young, whether mm-hmm. she saw, sort of saw some of the mistakes as well with this approach where they start teaching them the sword as soon as they're able to walk so i wonder mm-hmm. whether she just like wants to not make the same mistakes maybe 
And like she talks about or thinks about how Elucard did become, or she saw the potential in him to become a great, a true great king. And, um, but it only was after he sort of, like after his development, like at the beginning of Way of Kings, he wasn't a good king at all. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I feel yeah. like she's looking back with a little bit of a rose colored glasses at that because <laughs> I didn't see, I didn't see that much growth for Elkar. Like at the very end, yes, he was beginning to turn around, but like literally at the very end. Yeah. So I mean it I think is her she's, son. She's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like she's just being a mom, what all moms are supposed to do. So <laughs> Yeah, definitely at least nice to see that Gavino is doing a little better than he was in or, or the end of Oathbringer. And mm -hmm. or did I just say Gavino or said I Gavino? Gavino. Gavino. Yeah, uh, I hope he will see more of him and oh, get yeah, even definitely. better. Yeah. Especially since I think he'll be, what, mid-teens mm -hmm. in the back half? So... Who knows what's going to happen, of course, yeah. but at that age, like that's the age that Shalon was, you know, when mm -hmm. we first meet her. So it'd be interesting to see a little revenge story come around, oh. <laughs> assuming certain parties are still alive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hmm. And then poor Navani is like, during this whole exchange, she's blaming herself for what a student did which yeah i mean i i get it in grief yeah she's gonna be going through all those phases and stuff but like i don't understand how she can blame herself for what some other lady how would she even have known what was gonna happen yeah i feel like that's just generally something that navani tends to do like later on she also says like oh um a good um patron of the sciences should know when to stop bothering the scientists and stuff like that and like mm -hmm. she's constantly downplaying herself and uh mm -hmm. yet yeah, wants to put the blame on herself uh, for stuff that others really did and while rejecting the praise that others give her like uh, mm -hmm. fourth bridge was her idea idea but she talks about how all these other ardens pulled it off really so i feel like that's just one thing that she just does i guess it's like or maybe it's a relic of her relationship with gavilar mm -hmm. being kind of verbally abused and not treated very well yeah, in that definitely. relationship. Maybe she's kind of adopted that and um, thinks that she's being a nuisance or something when she really isn't. She's just being herself. <laughs> yeah. And a very good herself, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then speaking of when she was talking with the artists and letting them go back to their science and stuff, they're making telescopes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which is so cool. Mm -hmm. And I, I really hope they like the telescopes are good enough that we maybe might be able to see at least the other planets in some form. Like that, I don't know. They look at Ashen and it's just completely destroyed. And uh, I don't know. That would be super. Or maybe they even see those floating cities or something like that. Just like very small blobs or something. Like that. Wondering, oh, what, what, whatever might that be? That would be really cool. That would be a really powerful telescope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, not like then. My, I don't know how large the cities end up being on Ashen, but like, may just see like mm -hmm. weird stuff up there. That would be really cool, though, to kind of get a little glimpse at just the different, you know, heavenly bodies oh, yeah. that are around Roshar. And I wonder if this is like. Because you know how Brandon puts something in and then uses it like way later on. Um, it makes me wonder, like, why did he bring attention to this little telescope mm -hmm. fiasco here? Like, what was the reason for that later <laughs> on? You know? <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So that makes me uh, almost uh, be uh, I believe, I guess, that uh, there might be something there with like Ashen or Brace that, or maybe even the moons. I figuring out, mm -hmm. figuring out stuff there, but yeah, um, I guess it also gave him excuse to uh, introduce these lens makers um, mm -hmm. who previously were jewelers, 
and how they I really like how they are inspecting the black sphere here and talking about how it's um I guess it's almost a perfect gem mm -hmm. the way it's cut so yeah and apparently it's held on to that void light for six years I think Navani said yeah. and um it's still going strong so it's I don't know if maybe it actually is a perfect gemstone. They just don't have the tools to to really make sure and say a definitive statement about that or something. Mm -hmm. That that does make me wonder, like, where did Gavilla get the sphere from or, like, the gemstone mm -hmm. in it? Because I, no, I think it was one gemstone. Like, it wasn't in a sphere, actually, but I can't quite remember. But, like, did the Heralds provide it or... Does he some have somebody who just casually makes perfect gemstones for him, uh, or did he have anybody like that? Or maybe maybe there's like a, a special person who is very good at cutting <laughs> these gemstones, mm -hmm. and they're <laughs> manufacturing almost perfect gemstones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I thought that was really interesting too. Even I don't know if it actually means anything, but they said that the the value of that sphere would be more than a normal one because of the mm. cut of the, the gemstone inside it, which I thought that was kind of a neat little tidbit. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I guess it also makes me wonder whether they might study it further to figure out maybe how it was cut or how they could achieve um, mm -hmm. better um, yeah, ways of storing stormlight. But in general about the black sphere, um, Brandon has said at some point, like in some Bob, that by the end of Oathbringer, we should have figured it out what it is. And I, I did not know that, that he said that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've never felt uh, further away from understanding this black sphere because we, uh, instead of answering the mysteries, he just dumped more on us here. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Navani will hear back from these ardents and give us some more hints. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm completely in the dark about it. I have no <laughs> idea what it is. <laughs> I'm not going to pretend to know. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the way Relaine, and like you talked to Relaine about it, and he said it sort of pulses with a weird rhythm that he doesn't really mm -hmm. recognize. And rather than, like he says, that white light wants them or wants him, make uh, makes him want to draw in this uh, white light and use it. Well, this one is actually like repugnant, and he uh, mm -hmm. like he feels, yeah, I don't know, yeah, negative energy from it. I guess from the rhythm. It kind of makes me nervous because Navani was saying that she wanted to have a radiant try and mm -hmm. <laughs> draw in the void light from that. Yeah, like uh, that's probably not a good idea if we don't know <laughs> probably what it is. <laughs> Can like release some old god or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I I do wonder whether it might be a fuse that's uh, trapped in there. Like it, it, it requires a perfect gemstone because otherwise you couldn't contain it or something like that. Mm. So, well, when Relaine said that it was, it was had a different unknown rhythm. That kind of made me feel like maybe it was not from Roshar. Could also be, yeah. Maybe it's Rune Light. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. God, that'd be terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like if, if it is a fuse, I feel like this, or like with our, um, the nine are worried that the um, humans figure out how to capture what's uh, fused and uh, in general, how Navani, might, or where, where she might be going. I feel like it could be a fuse that's trapped in there and that mm -hmm. it's like sort of the key for them to figure out how to trap them. Uh, I could definitely yeah. see that happening. I wonder if we'll figure it out by the end of the book. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. Because otherwise, like, that Bob couldn't be further from the truth. Right. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about? Oh, just at the end when um, they all meet or are in the meeting room and uh, how I really love how much like a father-in-law Delana is acting there feel like it's uh, sort of a little like it's uh, he fulfills the stereotype in a way because he still wants to like talk to his son and uh, wants him to be his like the perfect Alethi man and stuff like that mm -hmm. and Shalan sort of firing back and I like how Navani says like they both 
don't want to obviously claim him for themselves, but they obviously do it. So that's really kind cool. of squabbling over him. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I really like, though, how Navani is approving of how Shalantan is letting Adolin kind of become his own person. Because Dalinar's there, like he's trying, Shalon's trying to turn Adolin into her, <laughs> but no, she's just allowing him to express himself, like yep. a, away from Dalinar's high standards and away from, you know, his expectations of Adolin. So I thought that was nice because <laughs> Navani's yeah. kind of like, you know, going to be his his stepmom. So she's trying to be a good role model and. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> I, I do find three new pairs of boots in a single week a little excessive, but yeah, it's cool to gold see. Gold trimmed boots. <laughs> gold trimmed boots, yeah. It's, and I yeah, love how he's like putting it up on a table to show people like, <laughs> look at my boots. <laughs> yeah. I love how boots is like a recurring theme with Shalana yeah. around. <laughs> oh, right, right, it is, yeah. <laughs> and uh yeah, I find it really cool that Adolin is a high prince and he's putting a different spin, uh, spin on the um, Colin prince, I guess. So mm-hmm. that's definitely refreshing to see. And yeah. then they're showing the maps to mm-hmm. Mink. And um, he's like, well, uh, you don't have any tables out here or anything. <laughs> and then Shalon's like, no worries. And then she does a little hologram thing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and also really loved the mink in this chapter again. Like, please have him in all the chapters. <laughs> <laughs> I know. He and Shalon bouncing off each other about like getting out of handcuffs and mm-hmm. escaping, like capture and stuff. And she's like, "Teach me!" And he's like, "Oh, I can't teach you. You're you're a high high lady or whatever they call her." <laughs> she's like, "Uh, no." <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's. I think that's all about uh, about all from me in this chapter. Mm-hmm. I guess I'm glad I, that they don't really trust Terravention anymore. Like I right. was glad that they don't. But yeah, yeah, he was only in this chapter for the tiniest bit, and I think I missed where he went before they all went into that room. I because we saw Dalinar right. and Terravention, and they were talking, and then. After she does her discussion with the Ardents and everything, they go into the room, but Terra Vengeance not there anymore. I don't know exactly where he went after mm-hmm. that. I guess uh, I, I can't remember whether Delina and Terra Vengeance just walked by them or whether they actually stayed mm-hmm. near them. But I guess Terra Vengeance just went inside again or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of sad because she mentions how Dalinar and he used to have these long conversations mm-hmm. and they were like friends and now he can't be trusted. So Dalinar still speaks with him, but he's not invited to any of these strategy meetings or anything. So it makes me wonder what kind of information Teravangian would be passing along to. Mm-hmm. Yep. If he's not, yep. you know, in the inner circle anymore, what information it, it, can he actually have? It does make me hopeful that they are misleading him a little bit at least. So he reports mm-hmm. false stuff to the fused because mm-hmm. maybe he does it on his own as well because he doesn't really trust them. But yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Terrengine is a bit of an yeah, unknown element at this point. He's slimy. Yeah. I don't like him. <laughs> Okay, so that was chapter 16. <laughs> you can find all of these preview chapters at 9 a.m. Eastern Time on Tuesdays. They're on tour.com. And we'll also let you know on 17thshard.com right at 9 o'clock when they come out. And also, audiobook chapters are being released on Brendan Sanderson's YouTube channel. They're probably caught up. So you can come and discuss them if you were waiting for those. You can talk to us on our Discord, on the forums, comments, wherever. Bye. See you next week.